Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's Ask ICAST webinar. This weekly series of webinars gives members the opportunity to find out more and ask a range of questions from the in-house experts here at ICAST on a whole range of topics. For those of those you that are joining us today that don't know me, I'm David Mingus and I'm the Director of Practice here at ICAST and I'll be guiding you through this webinar. To start off with, I do obviously have to mention right at the top that this webinar provides general commentary on the topics under discussion and uh, really shouldn't be relied upon as definitive advice as inevitably we will not have access to all the facts and uh, when you're using this in the real world out there in practice, uh, every situation is slightly different. As always, we expect our members to use their own professional judgment and seek other appropriate professional or legal advice where appropriate. In this webinar today, we're going to look at some of the latest developments and hot topics which have arisen over the last few weeks and which we've not yet managed to cover in any of our previous webinars. This gives you the opportunity to round up and uh, ask questions on any topic which are concerning you at this time. And while coronavirus remains a key issue for many, there are some major and significant changes impacting on business. The focus is now really being turned to secondary issues and the knock-on effects into more business as usual matters rather than general COVID-19 issues. In today's webinar, I'm delighted to be joined this morning uh, by my colleague Jeremy Clark, Assistant Director of Practice. Those of you who are regular attendees on these webinars, Jeremy needs uh, no real introduction as a regular. Uh, but for anyone who doesn't know Jeremy and joining us really for the first uh, time, Jeremy has significant experience in providing advice, counsel and support to members in practice, particularly in all aspects of practice management, including succession planning, practice m &A, staff issues and strategy. So along with myself, uh, Jeremy and I look forward to sharing with you the latest insights. But before I uh, pass across to Jeremy to kick off, just a few housekeeping matters to remind you of. We already have a number of questions submitted in advance, but questions can be submitted through the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen at any time. Questions submitted are only viewable by the presenters, uh, so we won't identify who the questions come from. So please don't feel shy about uh, submitting your questions. The webinar is being recorded and we will make it available on, for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you either want to refer back to it or share it with others. Everyone on the webinar is automatically muted, so no need to be concerned about background noise wherever you are. So as I say, we do look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar. Uh, and of course, we will get to as many of those as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy to take us through the first few topics. Over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, David. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. We're going to cover quite a few different things this morning. Um, I'm going to have a quick look at some tax updates and company house updates, and then David's going to pick up from there. So um, there's the the eight, I think, topics that we're going to look at um, in a bit more detail this morning. So the first one, just a, a tax update um, for the Enterprise Management Initiative. Uh, there's been a, a time limited exception to um, disqualifying event rules in this. The, the basic rule is that in order to uh, get the benefits of the EMI scheme, an employee has to work in the business for a minimum of 25 hours a week. Or if they don't achieve that, then at least 75% of their working time. And obviously, um, with furloughing, with part-time working, with um, just a general downturn and whatever, that may not be possible anymore. And the government have recognised this and the Finance Bill 2020 uh, is going to um, provide, as I say, a time-limited exception to that rule. Um, so it runs from the 19th of March 2020 and it ends at the end of this tax year on the 5th of April 2021. And uh, uncharacteristically, generously, it actually includes any EMIs that were um, granted after the 19th of March, so in the, during lockdown as well, if you like. Um, so basically, the, the way it's going to work is that any furlough time, any reduced working hours time, um, any you know leave that people have to take, um, which they wouldn't have otherwise had to take or whatever, 
as as long as they would have been working had COVID not happened, then the government will will accept that time, um, the downtime, if you like, as having worked for the purposes of the ENI scheme. So that's actually, um, as I say, maybe uncharacteristically generous of them to allow them to do that. So. Um, there's a the, the link at the top there just takes you to the government web page which explains that um, it's worth a read it gives a wee bit more detail other than what I've uh, outlined there and it also gives you the, the draft legislation um, and just an explanation of it so next slide please Brendan um, the other sort of tax related thing is really just the effect of COVID on businesses and you know everybody's looking at you know what happens to their employees what happens getting them back to work, um, how it's affected their trade or whatever, but very few folk I suspect have given a great deal of thought to potential tax consequences of some of the things that are coming out of this. So uh, my colleague in the tax team, uh, Susan Cattell, has done a, an excellent article. Again, the, the hyperlink there takes you to that on ICAST.com. And uh, she covers a number of things which are kind of interrelated, but you know, quite distinct in their own way as well. So. First of all, um, those that are maybe trying to diversify their businesses a wee bit and, and move into other areas, there's a danger that uh, that might actually turn into a new trade um, rather than being an expansion or a, a sort of extension of an existing trade. The example that HMRC give in their guidance is you know a restaurant that turns around and, and starts making face masks and they would obviously view that as a new trade um, you know, old trade of restaurant maybe ceased or if it didn't cease at least you know a new trade has and there's two trades going um, whereas a shirt maker or a dressmaker or something like that which uh, starts making surgical gowns and masks and whatever that would just be an extension of the existing trade um, I, I prefer the, being a, being a closet alcoholic, um, I, I prefer the whiskey analogy where, you know, the whiskey distillers, um, if, they're, if they switch from making whiskey to gin for whatever reason, because gin's selling better than whiskey at the minute, who knows, you know, that's, that's a, just a, a normal switch. But if they're uh, changing their production and using a lot of their, their output to make hand gel, sanitizing gel, then that would be uh, in all likelihood a new trade. So that's the kind of thing that has to be done. And it's important for cessation and uh, you know, commencement and cessation rules, but more, more um, importantly, probably for loss relief, because obviously you cannot use the loss in one trade against the uh, profit in the other. So um, quite important that you, you get that right. Is it a new trade or is it not? Uh, the second point is, what about when you stop trading? Is it you know, a, a, a temporary cessation in trading, um, or is it actually a proper cessation? Um, and so there's a wee bit of guidance in there about that as well. Uh, the general room seems to be that if you start over again with the same business and the same owner, um, it'll just be deemed as a temporary shutdown, if you like, as if you were refurbishing the restaurant or, or what have you. Um, but what if there's a change of owner? Um, that, you know, jumping onto the VAT, the transfer of business is a going concern. Is it a going concern if you um, shut down because of COVID and then sell the business on and somebody else starts up um, either in the same trade or a different trade? Is, is it a going concern when you do that? And what the revenue, we, we haven't got a you know, full answer from them yet. We have asked the question um, and what they're saying to us at the minute is it really depends on the timing and the individual circumstances. So there's no um, hard and fast rule. They will look at each one on its individual merits. Um, it seems to be that like, if you're in hospitality or whatever and you shut down and it reopens again several months, six months later um, with the same trade but a different owner, they will probably view it as um, a going concern. But if there's a change of use in the premises or um, you know, as well as a change of ownership, they probably won't. And the final point there, which is actually the third point, which I skipped over, is uh, income expenditure. There's a, a wee bit of a discussion on uh, .gov.uk about how things like donations of stock 
and various other things that folk have done in the course of the lockdown, um, just because they can't use whatever they've got or whatever in that's power or they need to shift it on. So quite useful guidance there. And finally, um, on the tax front, uh, there was a ministerial statement published uh, about six weeks ago now um, to do with benefits in kind and testing. So antibody tests, which are the ones that you take after you think you've had COVID um, and it's a blood test, that one is a benefit in kind if the employer pays for it. Whereas an antigen testing, which is a diagnostic one where you go and get the swab um, up your nose or down your throat, um, that one is not a benefit in kind. Um, so it's important to understand the distinction and make sure um, that you're, if you are paying for antibody testing, the post ones, just because you want people to come back into the office and to see whether they've um, got some form of immunity or whatever, um, and give them that reassurance, that is a benefit in kind. Um, there's a wee bit of guidance at the link that's at the bottom there to um, just explain how you calculate the value of that. Um, so that's worth looking at once you come to that point. So that's uh, really the um, the tax updates. Um, I think we will pop on now to companies house updates. Uh, it's nothing really revolutionary there. It's more uh, along the lines of just extensions in deadlines for um, filing accounts and for uh, confirmation statements. I'll not just read that, you're perfectly capable of reading that yourself, but um, quite, an, quite a significant extension in terms of confirmation statements and, and a useful extension of three months basically for uh, filing accounts. And there's also a, a change in the sort of shortening accounting reference periods. You can put that out a wee bit further, which is, which is helpful. So an ongoing recognition from Bayes and, and Companies House but it is still a difficult time for companies and you know, meeting compliance deadlines is probably not top of your list um, and giving a bit of flexibility. I think it's probably worth saying that having been given that flexibility, I wouldn't want to push your luck any further, so to speak. Um, you know, I think company sizes view will be that that is um, a fairly generous and helpful approach that they have taken. So if you then miss further deadlines, I think they're likely to be less sympathetic than, than they might otherwise be. So I think that's uh, all for me for now. Hand back to David. Thank you, Jeremy, uh, for, for, for that part of that there. Uh, just a reminder for everyone that uh, the slides will be available on icast.com forward slash webinars. Uh, afterwards. So uh, as Jeremy mentioned, all the slides there have various hyperlinks uh, to them. So um, you'll be able to, to download and get those uh, afterwards. So uh, again, also just a, a quick reminder, great to see some questions coming in, but uh, always uh, happy to take more. So please uh, do use the, the Q&A facility uh, at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, to submit any questions to Jeremy and myself. I'm just going to cover now some uh, general uh, new business COVID support measures um, for businesses and also in terms of supporting the recovery. I think it's generally uh, fair to say that most of the support measures now are, are becoming very targeted and very, very specific um, into who they're uh, intending to, to, to assist as, as part of the programme. And I think certainly as we see more and more, uh, we're moving more into local, local outbreaks and local lockdowns uh, and the expectation probably across government and uh, local authorities is that that is more likely to, con to continue, at least in the short term, rather than us looking down the, the, the barrel of a, a new national lockdown. Of course, that may come uh, further down the line as we move into winter and we'll need to, to see what happens within that just now. But I think you know, just really just want to highlight uh, the Aberdeen local restriction uh, has obviously been in the news of late. Uh, a new um, local outbreak in uh, Cooper and Angus uh, as, as well. At the at moment, there is no um, specified uh, assistance in relation to the Cooper and Angus uh, outbreak uh, just now. Uh, I was on a, a, a local, uh, sorry, a Scottish government uh, business uh, update call yesterday, 
and I know that they are looking at the lessons from uh, Aberdeen and uh, how that will play out into the uh, the Cooper Angus uh, community and such like. But just in terms of the, uh, you know, as an example, the Aberdeen Local uh, Restrictions Business Support Fund has been set up. That is administered through the Aberdeen City Local Authority Council. Um, it's very specific and targeted to hospitality businesses uh, operating within the Aberdeen City Local Authority area. And those that have obviously been closed as a, directly as a result of uh, a COVID regulation. There is a, 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 a law backing up the, uh, the, the local closure there as well. So it relates to those uh, businesses that have been forced, been forced to close down as a result of that regulation, and they must have been closed for a minimum of 15 days. I think, uh, perhaps not unexpectedly, it does obviously exclude those businesses which uh, had previously breached the wider COVID regulations and requirements uh, prior to the local restrictions. So uh, those bars, for instance, I suspect that... Um, you know, have been central to the, the, the local outbreak uh, are not likely or, or not seem to, to, to benefit from this grant aid. The grant aid that's, that's been made available is on a per property uh, basis for those as say, in the hospitality trade and uh, the grants available are a thousand pounds or fifteen hundred pounds depending upon the rateable value of the property. For those businesses that have multiple properties, so those uh, that may have multiple bars uh, in, in, in the area, uh, you uh, are limited to £10,000 uh, maximum across all those businesses. Um, so that's likely to be somewhere between uh, you know, seven and ten properties uh, in, in a group um, would be the maximum that you're, you're going to be able to claim for there. They have also set up a, a discretionary fund for other businesses which will have been uh, impacted by the, the, the local lockdown, um, but they're, they're not specifically um, named in the, in the regulations. So further guidance and details is, is uh, awaited on that the last time that I checked uh, on that, but just to say I guess that it's, it's not necessarily uh, restricted purely to hospitality businesses in, in Aberdeen. And as I say, you know, the Aberdeen scheme has been set up based on the um, information from, from less, or lessons from Leicester uh, and will be kept under review as other lockdowns uh, develop as well. Moving on to some of the other uh, COVID support funds that have been announced over uh, recent days. I just wanted to highlight the hotel support programme. Um, which is, covers grants up to £250,000 plus additional support uh, programmes. So that will include uh, assistance uh, to, for instance, cover business reviews, uh, allow businesses to carry out customer uh, and market research, um, look at uh, development of international trade, etc. Et so that is in addition to the uh, the, the, the grant payout of up to £250,000. It's intended to cover uh, larger hotels, so those with a rateable value of more than £51,000, and you have to have more than 50 employees uh, in, in, in the business as well. And I think it's just important just to say that that's not uh, 50 full-time equivalent employees, it is just 50 employees plus on the, on the payroll. Uh, the guidance goes into details about if you have uh, two or three smaller hotels, but within the, the one vicinity. Um, so, for instance, it's not unusual. Uh, you know, I can think of some, some, some hotels, for instance, in uh, Bridge of Allen or Stirling area, for instance, that are owned by the, uh, the, the same hotel group. Um, and you know, they individually, they might not have 50 employees in, working in each hotel, but collaboratively within the, the small local vicinity, they have more than 50 employees and that would be treated uh, potentially as, as, as one business there. So the programme will cover uh, both capital and operational costs and look at things. So for instance, with, with things like capital costs that might uh, cover things like introdu in introducing new uh, contactless systems or upgrading the, the, the hotel infrastructure or environment uh, for safety measures and, 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 and such like. 
Crucially, the eligibility criteria also talks about um, the jobs being critical to the local economy. So again, we're looking at things like the hotel being a key employer in the area or uh, really being uh, using local suppliers uh, for food supply in, into the area and such like for that. Expressions of interest for uh, this programme are open now and remain open until the 9th of September. Uh, so it's an expression of interest basis that goes in and then all uh, grant applications will be evaluated uh, after that. And uh, again, the links uh, is in the, 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 the hyperlink in the, in the programme there is as well. Also just wanted to highlight the new grassroots music venue stabilisation fund, which has been introduced by the Scottish Government. Uh, that's providing grants of £5,000 to £50,000 to owners or tenants of venues that are indoor permanent venues and have a capacity of less than 600 people. The guidance does indicate that exceptionally uh, they will look at uh, venues which are more than 600 but uh, an absolute top capacity of uh, 1,000 if it can be demonstrated that the venue has a significant gap grassroots focus uh, on that. The overall fund has uh, 2.2 million pounds to be distributed. So uh, I guess if you use the, uh, the sums and do the maths, there uh, again, there are not a massive amount of grants available. So anywhere between 44 and 440 grants will be available under this scheme. Um, and it can include uh, pubs and clubs but it has to be essentially where um, the grassroots music is driving the rest of the trade. So the main purpose um, or the um, pub trade of, the, of it is really subsidiary to the grassroots or the main focus of people coming into the pub is really around uh, hearing the grassroots uh, music venues as well. The final scheme that I just want to, to highlight is in relation to a, the Event Industry Support Fund, where grants of up to £10,000 per business are available. And that's really for businesses um, that are subsidiary to the grants uh, or to the events trade as, as well. So it's not just the event promoters, but it will cover things like florists, photographers, um, the AV uh, and um, subcontractors, joiners, etc., that, that, that would mainly supply into the events industry in, in, in Scotland. To be eligible for this grant, the businesses have to be able to demonstrate that a minimum of 40% of their income uh, comes from the event trade. Um, and uh, uh, you have to have a minimum of £10,000 per annum income uh, in, in relation to, to, to that business as well. The application process on this one is, opens on uh, Monday on the 31st of August and will close on the, uh, the 14th of September. Do need to highlight that this one is a first come first serve base, basis. Um, so because it is a fixed grant, there are a maximum of 600 applications. They will be dealt with on a first, uh, first come, first serve basis. Um, so I you know, obviously encourage you to uh, get your clients sorted out and uh, advised of this and able to submit their, their applications uh, from Monday as soon as possible to maximise their, their chances in relation to that grant. Finally, just in relation to the, uh, the COVID recovery side of things, I just wanted to highlight um, something which may be applicable not only to clients, but also to you as a, as a business uh, you, you, yourself, which is the Digital Development Loan Fund, which is available through, uh, which is Scottish Government funded. This provides uh, interest-free loans um, of £5,000 to £100,000 uh, loan repayable over a period of 60 months, uh, so, sorry, three months up to 60 months, uh, up, up, up to five years. And this is really about aiming about increasing digital capacity and digital capability uh, across, the, across any sector within Scotland. So not only does it cover hardware and software costs, uh, but it would also enable you to um, 
fund uh, access to new markets or improve your digital processes or even upskill uh, employees and staff. So this is really obviously highlighted, you know, the whole COVID period has highlighted the reliance on technology and uh, the need to, to develop that going forward. So within accountancy practices, for instance, this could be used to um, cash flow fund things like the development of your cloud uh, accounting platform, staff training on uh, the various apps or cloud accounting, and uh, that, that sort of thing. So if you're looking for more information on that, uh, that is available at digitaldevelopmentloan.org. Um, load of information there on, on, on that as to how that would be uh, helpful to you. Um, and again, you know, if you're looking for information um, on that sort of thing, Jeremy and myself uh, will be able to point you in the right direction of uh, other firms that can help you out uh, with that and to put together uh, a, a package that might be applicable to that. Just moving on, just uh, to return to office working, really just want to highlight that uh, last week the Scottish Government um, published the, the, the most recent uh, route out, roadmap out of uh, lockdown. And that is again highlighted that non-essential offices um, do not really have a, a, a final date yet for, for, for opening. Uh, so that covers a lot of the, 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 the work in the accountancy sector. We had kind of hoped that the, the 14th of September would be the date for that, but as I say, no uh, date given on that at the moment. Um, we have had quite a few questions, I guess, coming in from practices uh, around where clients have already opened up. Um, and therefore, you know, what's the implications of that in terms of can you go out to clients and work at their premises rather than necessarily in your own office? And I think the answer to that is, you know, it very much depends on the, the circumstances that, that, that you have. Finance is uh, defined as part of the critical national infrastructure. Um, not all of the services within finance and within accountancy practices will be will fall within that. So you do have to think about whether that is an essential service or not. So for instance, things like uh, preparing VAT returns, there is um, still a requirement to submit VAT returns on time. That's not been, um, you know, any, uh, remit given, given within that uh, as, uh, as yet. So that could certainly be seen to be um, a critical national infrastructure service, similar to payroll, other services may not. In terms of can you then actually go out to the client's premises, again, I think the, really that's really around uh, health and safety uh, considerations around that. Um, both as you as an employer, but also in terms of the client and their ability to, to do that. So you really need to, to look at what are the health and safety measures that are put in place um, on both sides uh, from that as well. And finally, obviously, it goes without saying that um, staff ability in terms of their um, shielding capacity or where they are in terms of shielding, what they are able to do in terms of public transport and their willingness uh, around that needs to be taken into account as well. So again, that's, it's, it's, it's really a play it by year or on a case specific basis um, rather than uh, specific guidance that, that can be given within that. And again, just want to remind you that the Return to Office Working Toolkit and guidance is available uh, from ICAST.com, which gives you a whole load of uh, toolkits, guidance, uh, templates that you can use to carry out those sorts of risk assessments as well. So just going to hand back over to Jeremy for the next section on, on this. Thanks again, David. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of things now which have sort of come to the fore um, a wee bit more often than previously. Um, professional clearance is one. Uh, we, we get a steady trickle of inquiries about professional clearance and how you go about it and problems with them um, and, and such like just in normal times. But um, over the last sort of two or three months in particular, we've seen that number increase. Um, I, th I don't think it's a quantum leap in logic to uh, conclude that that is because 
a lot of clients are, are moving around because perhaps of the, the COVID related uh, advice that they have or have not received and the service level that they have um, experienced during COVID. I think there is a bit more of a churn at the minute um, than we usually see. So just a, a reminder first off, um, just where the uh, ethical guidance on uh, professional clearance is set out. It's uh, section 320 of the Code of Ethics. There's a link to it there. Um, and if you're sort of in that position on either side of the uh, equation, if you like, it's worth having a read at that because it does explain um, a lot of the circumstances uh, reasonably well and what's required. But I think I just want to bring out the two things on the purpose of professional clearance. And the first purpose of it is to allow the new agent to decide whether or not they want to take that client on as a client. And that's the fundamental purpose of, of uh, professional clearance. Um, you know, there's no permission to be given you know, by the outgoing accountant, if you like, um, but there is information which you're obliged to give to a prospective uh, yeah, advisor, um, just which would allow them to decide whether they want to take the client on. Now, it's important uh, to mention that client confidentiality is paramount in that. So you need your client's permission to talk to a prospective advisor. You just can't have somebody you know, sending an email and saying, Jimmy's asked me to act for them. Can, can you tell me all about them? That, that's not the way it works. So you need your client's permission uh, to provide that information to the uh, potential successor. Now, if that permission is withheld, then you need to tell the other guy that um, and they can draw their own conclusions from that. So that's the first purpose. The second purpose is to um, allow an exchange of information um, of a different nature, which is just you know, handover information, uh, you know, payroll details, last set of accounts, last tax return, that sort of thing, which you know makes the the provision of services to the client uh, possible for for the incoming agent. And um, just on that point, uh, you know, th there is a, a sort of quantum. Um, limit on that. So there are certain things that you do have to hand over, but once it goes beyond a, you know, a reasonable amount, then you, know, you have to manage your expectations on that. The important thing is that you know, the system is designed to make sure that there's no prejudice to the client. So if you delay in handing over things like payroll records, especially if it's a weekly payroll, um, that may cause significant difficulty uh, to clients. And that's something you should try and avoid so that's uh, just a general bit of background on it. Some um, issues to consider, we've really talked about client permission. Um, reasonableness, time and response and the transfer of records and things. Um, on a working sort of basis, I would work on a couple of weeks to, to get that answered and hopefully at least, maybe not the transfer of records and information within a couple of weeks, but um, certainly an acknowledgement that you've received it and that there's no professional reason why your successor shouldn't uh, go forward. But I think you, you've got to maybe have a, a wee bit of, or give a wee bit of latitude um, in current times. People are really snowed under just trying to get the day job done and advise clients, you know, properly about all sorts of different things and transferring sort of clients and might just take a wee bit longer. So I think the message on that is try maybe to be, um, a bit more forbearing, but if you are on the receiving end of a request, you know, a client wants to leave, I think it would just be um, polite to acknowledge that you've received that request and that you will answer them as soon as possible, rather than just have your potential successor hanging, waiting, and then wondering what's going on. We have had a couple of uh, uh, queries just asking whether you know, a firm or a, a usually a sole practitioner is, is actually okay or that are they well um you know are they having problems health-wise or whatever because they haven't even acknowledged it and i think it would be just smooth the, smooth the way a bit if if when you get a request in you at least say um thank you received it we'll come back to you just as soon as possible um just a bit on 
additional questions you might like to ask um, when taking some somebody over um, around about the COVID grant things and whatever. Um, going back to sort of initial comments about the purpose of it, it may be that clients are moving because they got certain COVID related advice and they didn't like it and they're, they're opinion shopping or they want you, you know, the incoming accountant to do something that the previous accountant refused to do or um, advised them against doing uh, because in their opinion, it wasn't something that was either legal or um, correct. So I think that's important just to add that question in. Is there anything around grants about CJRS, about SEIWS or whatever that um, is important for me to know? Um, you know, did you tell them they couldn't get it and now they're asking me to get that sort of thing. So that's, uh, that's pretty much all on professional claims. One thing, David and I are more than happy to discuss, you know, individual circumstances and difficulties. Obviously, if it's between um, members, we can help facilitate if there is a real problem. If it's with uh, agents who are uh, members of other bodies, that's a wee bit trickier but it's not out of uh, the realms of possibility. So if you're having genuine trouble with uh, changes in professional appointment, come back to us and we will do our best to help you through it. Uh, next slide, please, Brendan. The, another thing, it's not really directly COVID related or uh, whatever, it's just to draw to your attention that the client money regulations changed at the beginning of lockdown. Um, it's just, coincidental, but it's probably something that slipped under the radar a wee bit. Um, the reason why they were updated was to try and simplify the language and the structure in it. Uh, and they hadn't been updated for a while um, and we wanted to try and make it a bit simpler. So we've moved some aspects of the what was previously in regulations just out of regulations and into guidance. Um, so and there is new guidance as well. It's important to, to emphasize that if uh, if something is in the guidance, that's what we expect you to do, and we will you know, rely on it um, in disciplinary proceedings if you do not follow our guidance. So it's not a case of, you know, it's not in the, it's not in the rules anymore, you don't have to do it. You know, the, the two sit side by side, and we will look at both. Um, one of the things we did was change the, the definition of a bank to try and expand it and take into account developments such as cryptocurrency. Um, so there's a wee bit of tweaking on that. It's um, one thing we didn't, however, uh, change or I think properly reflect just because it's it's an ongoing thing and it's developing very, very quickly. Cryptocurrency is actually older than challenger banks. Um, and I think it's important. Challenger banks, generally speaking, with a couple of exceptions, are not banks. They are what are called electronic money institutions. They are regulated differently. They fall outside the financial services compensation scheme. Um, and I think it, we haven't quite concluded on it yet, but it's unlikely that the, the majority of challenger banks will be banks according to the client money regulations and therefore you should not use them as client accounts. They're fine for your firm accounts, that's not a problem, but don't use them as client accounts. And one that's come up recently, um, which is sort of on a par with that, is payment processors um, who are really targeting payroll bureaus at the minute um, and saying this is a, a wonderful Wizard V's way to make life easier for your payroll people. And actually, you know, I can see the logic in that. They're absolutely, the, the processes are much more slick and um, easy to use than using traditional BAX methods and that sort of thing. But again, the payment processors, most of them are, certainly none of them are banks. Um, they, they tend to be either electronic money institutions um, or some other form of regulated activity, but they, they are unlikely to uh, qualify as banks in terms of the client money regs. Um, payment into client bank account no later than the end of the following business day. It just tightens up the time scale so a wee bit in what you have to do. So you can't leave it sitting around at the minute. Um, business as usual, I'm afraid on that. So um, in terms of you know, COVID and whatever, you still have to abide by those. I don't think we're going to relax that. The whole purpose of client money regulations is 
to protect client monies and, and we want to continue that. That sort of public interest is paramount. Um, and an alternate change notification to ICAS, if you have a client money account and you're a sole practitioner, you have to have an alternate in place, somebody who can sign on that um, and, and operate the account if you are unable to do so through ill health, wherever, again, COVID, um, we, we've had members who have succumbed to that and you know, have been out of action for a while. So it's important that you have that in place if you have a client money account. That's um, the definition of how quickly you have to do that's changed from within three months to now as soon as reasonably practicable. So finally, just on that point, again, there, I mentioned the guidance, um, the client money guidance helps you, but there's links to that. There's an annual, annual compliance checklist and a specimen letter to the bank, which you have to try and get, well, you have to get, not try and get, um, just, you know, if you're setting up a new client account, the trust letter to prove to us and to, to put in place a trust around your client account. So that's all I've got. Now, David's going to talk now on um, e-signing of accounts, which is another, uh, well, e-signing in general, not just on accounts, which is another thing that uh, has come up more recently and it's becoming more prevalent. So back to you, David. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Yeah, as you say, it is something that uh, we have been asked about quite a bit, obviously, in uh, the last uh, number of months around uh, e-signing. Uh, and such like. So I thought it'd be useful just to perhaps just make that more widely known, I guess, what the the issues are and uh, look at some of some of those circumstances. So I think it's fair to say that um, you know, e-signing or electronic communication has, has been around for, for, for some time. As you say, um, I've put down there the, the legislation. Uh, there are, are UK legislation, but there's also specific Scots le uh, Scottish legislation as well. Um, so you do need to be aware of that. And essentially there are two aspects to, to, to this. There are, is the, the actual um, electronic document and the transfer of an electronic document, so the sharing uh, of that electronic document. And separately, there is the signature part of, of, of the document and the authentication of, of that document. So there are two separate uh, things that, that, that really need to be to looked at as, as part of that. And quite often, in fact, well, I'll look at an example later on, there is almost a, a confusion between the two and uh, we do need to, 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 to look at some of those aspects separately. The general position is that uh, electronic documents are permitted. There are one or two exceptions uh, to that, and particularly in Scots law, there are, there are some exceptions to that. So the requirements of Writing Scotland Act 1995 um, particularly talks around uh, wills and, uh, and that sort of thing have to be uh, traditional documents as it's referred to. So they cannot be electronic documents, they need to be traditional documents, paper documents and wet signed uh, as, as, as part of that. Beyond that, the, the, the question is, do you need to have uh, any, any element of self-proving um, or witness statement uh, as part of the, of the document? And fundamentally, this comes down to, will you need to rely on this document as part of a, a court process or to prove something on, on that? So, in terms of electronic signatures, there are two different types. And uh, if we look at the, the next slide on, on, on this, we've got two separate types. There are uh, simple electronic signatures and qualified or advanced uh, digital signatures. And both of those are provided for in the legislation. So a simple uh, electronic signature it can be something just simply as you typing your name into the document or inserting a, a, a scanned picture of your, uh, your, your signature into a Word document or something like that. That's a simple uh, electronic signature. Qualified and advanced digital signatures are those which have some form of evidential status. And these tend to be software certificates uh, that are put in. And the difference between qualified and advanced digital signatures is really around that uh, level of authentication. So a qualified dig uh, digital signature will have an element of uh, software certification, whereas an advanced digital signature will have uh, even more 
um, collaboration in, in behind it. So it might be used in conjunction, for instance, with uh, two-factor authentication uh, or, 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 or that side of things. So if you look at um, three specific areas where we have had quite a number of queries on in, 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 in recent weeks and months, are really around uh, letters of engagement, signing off accounts and signing off the audit report. So if we look at each of those in turn, letters of engagement, uh, pretty straightforward in terms of they are capable of being an electronic document and signed electronically. There is no real requirement around um, the, the e-signature choice. That, as I say, really comes back down to how much reliance you, you want to put on that uh, e-signature. So if you don't think you're really going to have to rely on that uh, as part of a, a court process or really want to use that uh, or be able to evidence that terribly much, then a, a simple electronic signature from, from the, your side and from the client, probably backed up with a, a, you know, an, a, an email showing the exchange, uh, that is that that is perfectly uh, suitable. Obviously, generally, we would suggest that, as with any legal document, uh, you know, you may come to need to rely on that at, at some point, and therefore uh, a qualified or advanced signature would give you that slightly more um, reliance on on that. When we come to the accounts, uh, I think you know, we need to go back to what does legislation say and the Companies Act in uh, 2006 talks about the accounts being signed. Now, what does signed mean? Well, there is, there's nothing that's not defined in the Companies Act. It's not also defined as part of the Interpretation Act 1978, which is where most legislation provisions uh, would, would go back to. So the general provision then is that signed has its ordinary meaning. That tends to be where courts would, would, would tend to look at that. Courts have, have looked at this uh, not in relation to the accounts, uh, but in relation to other documents, and they've generally taken the view that it can be wide and varied. So it generally means any mark which can be taken to mean approval of that document. So that can be an X, it can be your initials, it can be the full signature, and it can be anything from wet signature, a stamp of a signature, uh, anything at all like that, um, as long as it's obvious and evident that there has been an approval given and it has been intended to have been approved in, in that situation as well. Added into that, Companies House guidance uh, certainly says that they will accept uh, electronic signatures um, and therefore it's, it, it is there. Some people do say it's recommended that the company retains at least one copy of the, of the accounts with a wet signature of the directors as part of the, the statutory account. But uh, certainly our view is that that is not absolutely necessary. Um, that uh, would be a belt and braces approach, I, 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 I think. Um, but unfortunately, as I say, there, are, there is no case law specifically on accounts uh, as yet, and until there is such time, I guess it will always be open to interpretation. When we turn to the audit report, um, again, we have the, the, the same position in terms of the Company Act, being talked about it, uh, about the audit report being signed. It is very specific, however, in that it must be signed by the senior statutory auditor. The uh, uh, auditing standards, ISO 700 UK, again, recognises that uh, electronic signing could be permissible. Um, it does emphasise that the uh, audit report does need to be signed by the senior statutory auditor, uh, but recognises that there may be instances where the, audit, the senior statutory auditor is not physically available to, 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 to sign the account. So maybe due to um, various circumstances or whatever that the audit report needs to be signed while the uh, senior statutory auditor is on holiday, for instance, um, abroad or, 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 or not physically in the office, as well as the, the, the COVID situations that we are in, in just now. So it does provide that uh, in the absence of the senior statutory auditor, um, electronic signing would be permissible. Um, 
and it gives the example of by email or fax. And I go back again to the, uh, the distinction between the electronic transmission and the electronic documents and the electronic signing. And this unfortunately is one of these situations where I would say the, uh, the ISA has, has, has conflated the two issues. Um, you know, email or fax is a method of electronic transmission of, of the document. It is not an electronic signing of the document. So our guidance really is, is and we will be issuing um, guidance, uh, you know, written guidance on, on this, but I just wanted to, to get this across at the moment, is that the audit report can certainly be delivered to the company um, electronically and it can be signed electronically. The main point is that it has to be signed by the senior statutory auditor. So you can't get somebody else within the office to insert that signature. Um, and therefore that's where simple signatures are, are, are perhaps less effective. Um, and certainly when it comes around to monitoring visits and, and, and such like, there would need to be a fairly robust procedure in place and control procedure in place and the evidential requirements to the evidence that it has been the senior statutory auditor that has even type signed their name in, in, into the, the, the audit report. Um, so, you know, or inserted the, uh, the picture of their signature uh, in there as well. So you need to think about that. We would obviously recommend that uh, advanced or qualified dig digital sig signatures are used. These can only be um, inserted by the relevant person and they, they're covered with a certificate. They're also covered with a, a date stamp, computerized date stamp. So it's very, very obvious uh, who has applied that signature and when that signature has been applied as well. There are plenty of um, electronic signing softwares out there uh, at the moment. They're not uh, necessarily uh, very expensive. So therefore, again, we would uh, certainly be suggesting that due to the, the, the cost and the additional controls that can be put in place, advanced uh, digital signatures is, is, is probably the minimum standard that we would really recommend suggesting uh, in, in those circumstances. But as I say, we can't rule out simple signatures. It complies with the, the law. It complies with the accounting uh, and, and auditing standards. Um, so if you do want to use some simple signatures, you can do so, um, but do, as I say, be aware of the additional controls and procedures that would need to be in place to use that and that would be expected to be put in place uh, when it comes to uh, uh, an audit monitoring visit. Finally, I think the, the last thing I really just want to cover is uh, just in relation to our general practice manual. Now, the general practice manual uh, it contains various help sheets, guidance, specimen documents, uh, which is available to all ICAST firms via ICAST.com. It's available to everyone within the firm. So anyone within the firm who uh, creates a login to ICAST.com will be able to gain access to the general uh, practice manual. And as I say, it covers a whole range of help sheets, guidance and specimen documents. Easiest way to access that is through icast.com forward slash practice and uh, then go through the knowledge area and the general practice manual. We started building this really at the beginning of the year and we started with content really around AML and letters of engagement because that, th those were the key areas that uh, were evidence that people have, have, have used. So I really just wanted to highlight some new material which has been added into the general practice manual in uh, recent weeks and months. So we've added in a fit and proper help sheet um, which covers all the processes that need to be put in place uh, to comply not only with AML legislation, data protection legislation, but also our audit regulations. Um, so there's a requirement under various aspects for firms to carry out fit and proper uh, checks and confidentiality checks, etc., cetera, um, in relation to clients at, uh, over the piece. So within that uh, fit and proper help sheet, we've also included um, statements of independence and confidentiality and confirmation of fit and proper status 
uh, checklists that can be used both for audit registered firms and more generally and those are available with links from that help sheet. The other thing that we've added uh, fairly recently is um, a specimen reference on client's financial statement and, av av and ability to service loans. Um, so that again typically will be where, for instance, a client might be looking for a, a mortgage um, and the building society mortgage loan provider uh, comes to you asking for a, for a reference around that. So we provided some uh, sample wording that can be used in those situations and some guidance around the, the issues that you need to be considering prior to providing that reference. From the regulatory monitoring side of things, um, there's a help sheet there on health issues around, so again, particularly uh, relevant around this time where, for instance, um, somebody might be self-isolating or not able to undertake um, a regulatory monitoring visit um, or uh, respond to regulatory monitoring stuff at, at that point. So again, that help sheet just covers the, the issues that you need to be thinking about and what action to, to take uh, in those circumstances. Finally, really just looking at the tax computations and tax return help sheet. Um, so there's some information there and we've provided uh, a list of checklists and uh, tax return control uh, sheets for uh, various self-assessment and uh, sole traders partnership corporate uh, stuff there as well. These have all been updated fully for the 2019-20 uh, tax return season. Uh, so again, all of these are available there as well. So we will continue to add into the, the general practice manual over the coming weeks and months. If there's anything particular that's missing that you uh, want added, uh, please just drop us a line um, and we will uh, do our best to, to add that in as soon as possible. If we're not able to add it in immediately, we will uh, try and help you with uh, providing you with source documents or, 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 or something like that in the meantime. So that's that, that's in the main of this, the stuff that we're, we're covering today. Just having a quick look at some of the questions that are, that are coming in here. Jeremy, a question for you going back to professional clearance. Um, if a practice doesn't um, reply to a professional clearance request and no accounts or TV are available, Will HMRC provide breakdown of prior year figures? The question that's come in from Heather. Okay, there's two parts to that. First of all, HMRC might not have the breakdown of the figures because if it's just a three-liner on the tax return, then they probably won't have it. Secondly, will they provide it? Um, in the past, many, many years ago when I was uh, a boy, they, they may well have done, um, but I think it will probably these days be quite difficult to talk to somebody in HMRC who would be in a position um, to do that even if they were minded to and uh, finally uh, well sorry I'm just thinking at the same time they uh, HMRC would probably take the view that even if the other accountant doesn't um, give you that information the client should have it so I think on balance I would say it's highly unlikely that you'd have success on that front. Um, I think you just have to keep plugging away, trying to get it. If your client doesn't have it, which is possible, um, then you just have to keep plugging away at the previous agent. And if you run into a complete brick wall and they're one of our members, you know, get in touch with us. And if they are a member of another professional body, get in touch with that professional body. Um, and if they are not, um, a member of any professional body, then that's a wee bit more complicated. You might just have to get the client to go around and have a conversation with them um, and get that information. But it's uh, unlikely that HMRC will, will be overly helpful in that regard. That's great. Thank, th thanks very much for that, Jeremy. We are uh, unfortunately almost out of time now. We are up to our hour that we have uh, here today. So uh, just want to thank everyone for, for, for joining us. Uh, please remember that you can keep up to date with the latest information, guides and resources through ICAST.com. 
for all your tax general practice areas as well as the coronavirus hub. CA Connect also has a range of forums to keep you and fellow members in touch and connected. And uh, obviously please remember that you can also use the technical help desk uh, to contact us uh, for anything else as well. Looking forward to uh, our webinars going forward next week. I'm going to be delighted to be joined for a VAT update uh, by uh, Lynn Gemmel from Gemmel McGee VAT Solutions. The webinar will cover uh, all the need to know upcoming changes, insight into what's uh, been seen reasonably uh, recently with HMRC inspections and uh, HMRC communications. So um, do please join us for that. For the remainder of September, we do have a, a wide and varied and interested, uh, interesting programme of webinars, uh, including opportunities to gain insight and put your questions to uh, the Under Secretary of State for Scotland, as well as a panel from the House of Commons Treasury uh, Committee. So uh, lots of webinars to, to join us with over the coming weeks. And you can, of course, sign up to all of those webinars at icast.com forward slash webinars. It only leaves me to uh, thank Jeremy for joining me today uh, for his in expert insight and answering the, the questions that's there. I do hope that this webinar has been helpful to you. And it would, of course, be great to receive your feedback on this webinar and, of course, any other topics that you wish to uh, see us cover in the future. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. And until we, next week's Ask ICAST webinar, goodbye.